Matt, thank you very much. So we have lots of time for questions. So I open it up for any questions you want to ask about any ideas you have or startups or any of this conversation that Matt has just started. Any questions? Yes. Since the business plan is uh, very important in the starting of a business, is there any where we can uh, find some sample business plans that have gone through and, for example, the ways we should write, it's better? Yeah, so that business model canvas that I mentioned, there's a whole book about that called Business Model Generation. And I think it's like a $20 ebook, so it's well worth buying. And that has examples of what you can put into that document. Um, many business, like when people send me a 40-page business plan, I file it in the circular filing cabinet. It's not very useful to me. But what is very useful for you as an entrepreneur is it teaches you all the things that you need to know when I start asking you questions about your pitch. Okay? So when somebody comes and pitches to me their idea for the business, I'm going to drill down with various questions about their competitors, about their market, about their focus, about what their, what their uh, product distribution strategy is. If you've done that business plan, you know the answers to those things. You don't necessarily need to send it to me to wade through, but you need to have it for yourself. So if you look at that, this presentation will be available afterwards, right, Sveta? We're going to just yeah. let people grab this. Um, the, I, I mentioned where that comes from, the Alex Osterwalder. If you search him on Google, you'll find that book, and that teaches you all about it. No worries. Uh, one more question. Yes. Uh, what kind of characteristics does an entrepreneur uh, need to have in order to be successful? Ah, an entrepreneur's characteristics, right, apart from being ADHD. Um, <laughs> look, I think... There's a wide spectrum. There's no sort of one. There's the one model of you know they have to be an Aries and they blah blah blah. There's not. It's not like a, a dating type of thing. You need to have resilience and you need to have passion for your space, yeah. And you have to have a bit of uh, hustle, right? Willingness to sell yourself and your company and your product. So hustle is. You'll see it in that video that I um, suggested. The Alec Baldwin one is all about selling. Um, so you don't need to be a salesperson, but you have to be willing to put yourself out there to be shot down and then just take those bullets, let them bounce off you and go do it again. That's the resilience bit. So they're the things that I think are really important for entrepreneurs. Yes. If you shout, I'll repeat your question. Ah, do you have to quit your existing job? Yeah, no, just don't do it during office hours. No, you don't have to quit your existing job, but um, at a certain point, yes, you should. Okay? Definitely, if you're going to go out and try and raise money from angels or family, you have to tell them you're going to be quitting your job. You can't hedge your bets. You can't. Those of you who have been watching Shark Tank, right? No, they never invest in anybody who says, I'll be doing this part-time. They always say, I want you 150% working with my money on this idea. Yeah? So... No, they won't invest. Well, yeah, even two things they won't do. That's right. Like, tell me which idea. That's the point about focus, right? I've had many pitches to me where people come to me and I've got these four things and they're really awesome and I'm going to do all of them. And you're like, no, which one? If I made you pick which one, and they can't. They can't throw the three babies out and just pick one baby to go forward with, right? Because it's all their children for them. So, no, you don't have to quit your job to start with. Not for the first stages of this, but ultimately, yes. <laughs> Next, yes. Um, what are the sort of triggers you look for which uh, instigates moving from the lab or an idea to starting to speak with people, engaging with people externally uh, to get an idea off the ground or take that next you can, step? You can do it very early. So if the lab, if the lab tests are showing... The, uh, a step change in what you're doing compared to business as usual, get out there and start bouncing it off people. You need to be able to phrase what you are doing in a fairly succinct manner. So um, sometimes people describe things in a very technical manner and they'll just get rejected because people can't understand it. So you need to, that's why, where it's important to find a mentor to talk to early so you can bounce those ideas around and get, get your elevator pitch down to one sentence, right? 
And so the, the concept of an elevator pitch is you, you get in at the ground floor, you're going up the elevator, you've got somebody next to you who might invest in your company, that's how long you've got to convince them to be interested, right? And if you can phrase your lab results in such a manner that if, if I take this, I can turn it into money in this way, you're, on, you're off. So I'd go very early to start bouncing those things around. Um, sure. Ah, yeah, so that's a great question. So um, ideas have almost no value, okay? However, research which, uh, for which dollars have been invested um, does have value. And if you are showing that to your largest potential competitor and he can replicate that very rapidly, then there's, there's risk associated with that. So if it's something that you can get IP protection around, the university, I'm pretty sure, can help you. There's a commercialization office. They do that kind of thing. They can do provisional patents and, and put that down on stuff. It's not something I see very often in the software space. It's pretty rare. But if you've built something, like if, if you were a biotech startup and you'd built some new pharmaceutical thing, you're never going to raise money unless you've got a really strong patent. Super strong, like rock hard. Um, so patents are extremely important in some spaces. You're allowed to share ideas under confidentiality agreement with people um, prior to patenting it. Once it's out there without a confidentiality agreement, you're, you're stuffed. It's, it's like in the free world. So um, making the judgment about that, I'd suggest talking to the commercialization office within the university because they're free and available. Um, uh, but if it's just a software idea, it comes down to execution. And you have to expect somebody to steal your ideas. So the first thing to do is start getting customers. And realize that even if you only capture the Geelong Melbourne market, you'll probably have enough money coming in to surf for the rest of your life at some stage. No worries. Yes. What's your advice for people with ideas that require like high setup costs? Like for us, I mean, software, you know, you can write the code, you can just ship it. Kind yep. Of yep. Hardware, your, for example. If your idea requires, you know, the construction of a factory, like what's your right. advice for that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> So if you have a, a capital-intensive idea, let's say, yeah, something which requires many, many millions, um, forget about it. No. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's extremely hard these days, right? Because um, if you pitch to somebody that I've, I'd like to, this is the classic green tech example, right? People who wanted to create biofuels, um, refineries, they could show a market in the future, but they needed $15 million up front and the hope that the, you know, renewable energy targets stayed up even after Abbott won government. I mean, you know, the investors just shy away from that kind of thing. It's very, very hard to get it. Generally speaking, people who do that, they have an existing factory somewhere else that works, or they build a really, really tiny prototype factory which is, which is being sold down at the local market and doing great. Right? So uh, one of my co-founders in Ewa, her husband, um, decided that he really enjoyed distilling liquor. So he distilled a type of gin which tasted really good. He bought this tiny little still and he experimented and he tested and he found a really good formula that he really liked that has particular additives to it. Then he bought a bigger still and he started making bottles and selling them to the local pubs right under license and so on because you have to get a license to do this stuff. And the local pubs loved it and they ordered more. So then he started shipping them over to Melbourne through a distributor and before you knew it, he. West Wind Gin, you may have come across it now and then, he now owns that and it's this huge business that's shipping all around the world. He won competitions in Paris and, and, and Los Angeles, but he started with something small to prove it up and then grew and grew and grew. Um, it's very hard to raise substantial sums, like anything north of $3 million, incredibly difficult to raise. Right, so data analytics in the venture capital industry for analyzing who to invest in. Okay, so there's quite a bit of that going on in the States. There's almost none of that going on in Australia. So the Australian venture capital market is, is quite unsophisticated in dealing with uh, opportunity flow or deal stream, as we like to call it, because there's only about, I'd say, six or eight active early stage VCs in Australia. I'm not one of them because I've passed the five-year point on my fund. I'm not doing any new investing. But in the States, they do this very... Um, very actively, and if you're interested in that, that area, then have a look at a site called Mattermark. Have you ever heard of these guys? 
So it's one word, M-A-T-T-E-R-M-A-R-K. They do a fantastic daily email summary of VC write-ups, and Mattermark is a pure data analytics business for VCs. And they uh, analyze um, startup activity and hotness and social media shares and downloads of apps and visits to website and all this kind of stuff. And then they rank these startups into all various different categories and it allows the VCs to target their investment pitches. Yeah. So they use very sophisticated techniques in the US to, to deal with that. And then they build syndicates around it. There's another, another site which is interesting in relation to this is angel.co, which is AngelList, which is a place where entrepreneurs can put up ideas. So if you're looking for new ideas in a particular space or you've got a new idea and you think somebody else might have already thought about it, have a search on AngelList because you'll see startups who are pitching those ideas to investors way before a product has been built. Angel.co is the, is the domain. Okay, no worries. What I was talking about in terms of sophisticated with VCs though was actually their investment vehicle, the, the way they invest in preference shares and they have certain entitlements if the business goes poorly, which is called a liquidity preference. So if I put a million dollars into a company and it gets me say 20% of the business, but ultimately the whole thing gets wound up and there's a million dollars in cash sitting in the bank, all of it would come back to me under the liquidity preference, even though I only own 20% of it. So there's no kind of free, here's $800,000 for the other guys. Okay, other questions? Far away. We've got a bit of time, haven't we, Spader? Right. Please. <laughs> yes. Uh, what if your idea is an area that you know nothing about? Right, if your idea is in an area that you know nothing about, go and find someone who does know about it. Right. And learn really fast. But um, there's no reason that can't, that can't be the genesis of your idea. Um, the, what you then have to do is, as I said, dive deep and learn everything you can about that area. So become the expert before you talk to anybody else about it. Right? So you might say, well, what about blah, blah, blah. Go research it. And by the time you get in front of anybody who might be an investor or a partner or a potential hire the, or a co-founder, you have to be the expert more than anybody else in the world. Right? And so many times I've had pitches to me from people who, who claim to be experts in a particular field like drones or something like this. Or like I, one of my companies is an ag tech company that does agricultural software for farmers to plan out their crops and to record what chemicals they've sprayed on and all this kind of stuff. So I know a lot about agricultural technology now. And then people come and pitch to me about drones and how they can fly over ag farms and they just don't know their stuff because they haven't done their research, but they're really excited by drones because drones are so cool. <laughs> and it just, just doesn't work, so you've got to dive deep. But yeah, if your idea is outside that area, go learn about it. There's so much online now that you can learn. So many great blogs and stories from entrepreneurs and startups and that kind of thing. Yep. Yes, they do. Uh, uh, companies outside the US, is there any strategy that you recommend? Or is there any particular yeah, we have the advantage that there's not as many competitors, right? So um, Australia is a great pilot market. So if for a VC investor, like uh, the Australian market is a very small market for me. Everything that I look at as an investor, I want to go global at some stage. But as I said, that you have to start with a focus. and. You know, I'm dealing with startups in Perth, that's where I live. That's a very small focus, right? The most isolated city in the world, pretty much. And they have to deal with people there. And I say, oh, we're the same time zone as China, so that's awesome. I haven't seen any startups in Perth that have been dealing with China at all, I wish. But, um, you know, so it's, the benefit is that you have a very captive market. We've got very high penetration of technology. We've got a lot of early adopters. Um, there's, a, there's a wide variety of business types. Um, so when we do finally go to the US, you should be able to kill it with your product because you've done all the work you have to do. And this ag tech startup I spoke about, Ag World it's called, they're exactly doing that. They go and pitch to US companies now and those companies, they start saying, oh, more ag software. Ugh. And by the end of the meeting, their jaw is on the floor. They're just, I can't believe somebody in Australia built all this. This is amazing, right? Because they've got 70% of agronomists in Australia using their product. There's not much growth left in Australia. They've got to get, get off to the US where there's 10 times more agronomists ready to buy their product. Okay. 
Yeah, keep going. Uh, you mentioned uh, Derek Sivers before. Yes. Um, I pay attention to Elon Musk. I think he's a bit of a hero. He is he's awesome. He, I'm loving Elon. Who, um, who else should we keep an eye on, or who do you recommend we read? Uh, to ah, oh, okay, so that's a good one. Um, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> actually, that's a great idea. If you look at my Twitter stream, like it's so few. I've only maybe posted, I don't know, 300 tweets in my whole life, right? If you scroll through that, there's some guys who show up a lot. The, the one who, who springs to mind most highly is a guy called Mark Suster, who's from a VC in Los Angeles called Upfront Ventures. And this guy writes about the whole startup experience and VC investing and... and um, and being a manager of a new startup team and uh, everything he writes I just say oh god I wish I'd written that because that is exactly the way I would want to say it he's incredible so he would be top of my list there's a few others but you'll find them on the Twitter stream a lot of the people who um, uh, were the founders of Y Combinator yep. write very good blogs and I put up a post about kind of midlife for um, startups just over the weekend which yeah so that's the place to find it Thanks for answering my own question. <laughs> what would you consider the average kind of or usual value for angel um, investment in a new company? Okay, so the typical angel investment range. So angel investment will be anything between 50,000 at the low end to maybe 250,000 at the high end. Uh, you can potentially get a syndicate a little bit larger, but that's generally the range. Most angels will put in between twenty-five to hundred thousand dollars themselves, depending on the net worth. So that's that's what I would think. When you're going out to raise angel money, you've got to think about that kind of range. If you're going out to raise six hundred thousand dollars from angel networks, it's going to be quite challenging. Um, and I'm talking more the Perth context. You, you probably do a little better in Melbourne, so you might be able to add one hundred, two hundred thousand to that out of the Melbourne angel community. They're a bit more. Um, wealthy. So there's a question at the back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if, I, uh, if I want to start a startup uh, without any uh, fundraising, I mean, it's just with a small amount of money that I can afford. So what is the most important aspect that I have to think about? What's the most important aspect you have to think about if you want to start a startup with your own money? Yeah. Okay, so um, are you quitting your existing job? <laughs> The most important aspect is paying your bills, right? And keeping your relationship alive if you happen to be in a relationship. So, you know, so if you've got a wife or a girlfriend or anybody who relies upon you, then you have to make sure you cover them, yeah? So if you're quitting your job to do your... Like, it, it breaks my heart to see entrepreneurs who have quit their job and been going for, at something for six months, which is clearly going nowhere, but it, they, won't, they won't give up and go back to sorting out their life and just getting a regular job. You have to, you have to learn to f fail fast, is one of these famous sayings, right? If something is not working, either pivot and change to something else, which pivot basically means you screwed up and you better change it, um, or stop it and get back to sorting out your life so you've got a new pot of savings that you can eat into and have another go later. Right. Resilience doesn't mean stupidity. It doesn't mean just keep on doing it. How much do you need and what, where should you focus your spend? Well, you, if you're able to give up your salary and do this thing 100%, the focus of your spend in, in, in software is, is about the product and making the customers happy. What I, what I say to all my startup entrepreneurs is make your customers so happy that if you took the product away from them, they would cry. Right? <laughs> if, you, if you make them that happy, everything else falls into place, right? It means you can double your prices and they'll still be happy, right? So, so what you really want to do is, is build something where, where people just can't live without it and they, they want it there all the time and you can't take, take it away from them because they'll get really angry with you. Um, and then money will come in, investors will come in, people will want to work for you, the rest will just fall into place. That's the one thing. Yes? Yeah, it might go well, it might, might fail, you can't see the profit up front, what should you do? That's not, val that's not validated, is it? Right? Don't proceed. Keep working on it until you believe that you can see that pathway to profit. It's okay if the pathway to profit takes a while, right? But it should be growing every month. It shouldn't be something which is 
goes a little bit and just stays flat for a long, long time or goes backwards. One of the problems is scaling up. That's a great problem, right? That's like the problem of tax. It's a great problem. <laughs> I've made money, now I have to pay tax. Oh, I hate tax. No, I love making money, right? It's the same with scaling up. If you have a problem that, that you know, you were servicing five customers and now you've got 50 customers, that is a really good problem. So don't worry about scaling up, right? Especially on the infrastructure side these times. With, with Amazon Web Services, you literally go, okay, I've got 5,000 customers, dial, done. Right? It's cost you a few hundred bucks extra per month. It's nothing. It's amazing these days how scalable things are. Payment gateways, well, they all, it's a piece of cake. Compared to the dark old days of seven years ago, easy. Never worry about scaling up until, until you get that 10 times every day happening. Yes? So, thanks, Matt. So, you pointed out the, really, the need for resilience, the need for a great idea, and uh, the need to be able to make decisions, you need to be able to make decisions quickly about, um, about dropping it or about changing it or being flexible. Yep. Um, for really early stage entrepreneurs, um, how, could you say a little bit about how networks um, or, or, or experiments like Spark might contribute to helping you understand when you need to do what? Yeah, so that very early in my presentation I talked about getting mentors, right? So the, the initial idea and the bouncing those ideas off people needs to be done with people who have a bit of experience if you can. So um, what Spark gives you is access to those mentors, uh, people who've done it before. It gives you a suite of them to choose from. It's lovely having a shopping list so you can pick the right kinds of people you want to hang around with. And, and that ad advice and support is absolutely crucial. It's also crucial to, to build the resilience because there will be a, a very large number of people who say no to you when you st are starting out your startup. Uh, there will be a lot of people who say no to funding. No, that's a stupid idea, right? But you only need a few yeses and you can be off and running. Um, so um, learning to cope with those, those little failures and trip ups along the way, it's great to have people who've been there before to walk you through it. And um, these programs help you stay structured, but they also are extremely good at keeping you moving forward, cracking the whip, saying, okay, we're in this week, it's now time for you to get your minimum viable product up or to register your business or to, to have a shareholders agreement properly documented or to have secured your, or you know, to get a survey monkey survey out. Whatever it is, every week there's something that you need to do when you go through these accelerator programs. And it's, it's a great uh, motivator to have somebody pushing you to do this. And then you get that amazing sense of success as it happens. When it happens, it drives you to go to the next step and want to do it. So that's one of the core values of, of those things. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. So the minimum viable team being who are the, the the key people that you need to do your thing. So, generally, the passion of a very uh, successful uh, idea entrepreneur will drive people to want to work with that person. So it's all about, like I was saying earlier, sell, being able to sell yourself as well as your company, as well as your product, right? If you can sell yourself and your vision and your passion for this and, you, and where you think this is going to go, people will want to work for you. They'll want to work for you over their weekends. They'll, they'll give up time and they'll, they'll, they'll commit to it. If you need to, give them some, give them some equity, right? There's one of my favorite sayings about equity is um, it's, it's, if you group it all up in one place, it's a, it's a pile of shit. If you spread it all out, it's fertilizer, right? <laughs> So if you, um, if you are in the early stages of your business and you're talking to somebody who can really add value and you don't have any cash for them, there are other things you can offer. You can offer the, 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 the passion and, and, and vision that you have about the product, what, how they can go out and change the world. And you can also say, and if you stick with me for the next three years, here's how you will earn 10% of the business, 5% of the business, whatever it might be. Right? But make sure they earn it. Don't give it to them up front. This is where mentors and advisors are really important. There's, there's ways of structuring equity so that people have to earn it. In the Valley, the standard earning process is four years. Right? It was the last time you met anybody who stayed at a company for four years. It's pretty rare. Right? But that's what they have to do in Silicon Valley to earn all the equity that they're offered when they first join a, a startup business. 
So there, there's some of the ways to do it. Other ways to do it is teach yourself. Right? They're, they're, one of the entrepreneurs I invested in, he, he really needed good design in his product. So he read every design book you could imagine and learned about design and then he put together these incredible designs just so he wouldn't have to pay a design of $20,000. Okay. Last question. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, you know leveraging on the team you have uh, on producing the developer cup. I think uh, in the middle of the presentation you mentioned something on that. Reducing developer cost. Yes, on investing on R and D or something. It's just a very. Oh yeah, the R and D tax concession. Yeah, so the R and D tax concession is a federal government program where you say I'm going to be developing a piece of software which is complex and challenging and may fail. Right? The chance that it may fail means that the federal government considers it research and development. Okay? And if you're building a prototype product or, or, or working on that, then the cost of you paying a developer or a contractor to do that is something you can claim in your tax return with your company as a research and development cost. If you register for that before April of the June 30th year end, you can make a claim for the losses that the company's made and you can get up to 43 cents in the dollar back from your R&D tax claim. It's one of the easiest supportive research and development programs in the world and very generous. Uh, so all those people who kind of abuse the Australian system for not being there for innovation, this is a, one of the few shining lights that you actually have. Oh, last, last question. <laughs> Aha, that's a good point, yeah. So social returns instead of financial returns, yeah. Well, so you can raise money from, uh, for, for social returns from um, uh, charities. You can do it from uh, those fundraising sites, right, in, in GoGo and, and uh, Kickstarter and so on. Um, so there's various different ways of getting cash into a, a social return type project. Um, and there's a lot of... Uh, like hack days and events around social entrepreneurship um, uh, and resources that you can tap into to find out more about that. So definitely worth searching social entrepreneurship online and checking what's available in Melbourne and Geelong um, because it, it's quite a big uh, movement in, in, even in little old Perth. Sorry to keep referencing Perth, but that's my home. <laughs> and it's raining there. It's sunny here. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Thank you.